Okay, uh, wait, get get him up there. Oh boy. <laughs> uh, I really, I actually don't know what to say. Uh, Jonathan Cade is, uh, he's been around as long as I've been around in the club. Uh, he has been one of the most active members in the club since I've joined the club. Uh, he is a large reason why I stayed on the board uh, and probably a reason why I will continue to be active after I've left the board. Uh, in ten years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just a little bit about his background. I don't actually know that much. I know he works for Amazon. Uh, he does software typey stuff. I always see weird uh, characters on his, his keyboard. Uh, so he's doing that kind of thing. But uh, when, it, when you're in a pinch, uh, this man will, will get you out of trouble. Uh, and so when we needed someone to put together a history of the Stargate Observatory, uh, guess who got us out of that jam? Uh, Jonathan Cade. So let's give him a big round of applause. So the thing is, I actually can get you into trouble too, but that's another story. So everybody's familiar with this view, right? Is that so <laughs> this is Stargate in 1970, just after it opened. So how long have we had Stargate? Does anyone know if, uh, say that again? Well, 50 years, I kind of gave that away. But, uh, but, of course, the loss was founded in 1961, which means that there were eight years before we broke ground on Stargate. So what happened before Stargate? Well, the Warren Astronomical Society was founded when a group of young people led by Clarence Trott, who is one of the adults in the room, broke away from the Detroit Astronomical Society. And uh, we started meeting in 1961 at Weber Elementary. Uh, lots of, as you can see, there's a lot of kids here. Uh, lots of people in the wake of Sputnik were building telescopes, grinding mirrors, and just generally uh, trying to get in touch with the sky that was changing and having geopolitical connotations. It was something that society cared a lot about, and it was a time when astronomy clubs burst out all over the country. So, we actually got uh, moved through several schools, but we ended up at Lincoln High in Warren, and uh, there we actually got the school to build an observatory, yeah, still there. which is still there. So these photos were taken by Mark Kedzier, uh, and, uh, well, by Alana Kedzier, uh and Giacalone, and uh, you'll see Mark there. So he took the tour that many of us can get. And you may see that Lincoln, uh, the Lincoln Technology Center is called the Mark A. Kedzier Center. So, so this is a man right here who has had a big impact on Warren's public school. So, but, uh, here's the Lincoln Observatory out there. Yes, sir. Just one point uh, of, of note, when Lincoln High School, that building was built in 1953, yeah. that was the founding place of this college. So they were given college classes, and that's when the observatory was actually put on as part of the original uh, construction of the high school. And everything. So it's been there since 1953. Awesome. So, so right? <laughs> that's my tune. Yeah, it's Photoshop. So this is, uh, yeah, so this was... Uh, Room 215, where we originally met. So this was where we met at Lincoln High. And so Mark is going to take us up the stairs to the observatory. And you'll see things are kind of empty right now, and I'm sure they are still to this day. So here Mark is finding the pier mount holes. And you may wonder, where did the pier go? And the answer is Stargate, So, along with the telescope. So, so there's a glimpse of where we came from. But uh, 1960, and we actually built the F4 Stargate telescope as a classical Newtonian uh, at, and installed it at Lincoln High School. And these are images of it from, from those days. And uh, the skies were starting to get pretty bad in Warren, and we were looking for a place to have a observatory in dark skies. And at that time, 29 Mile was a great place. 
So we uh, started discussing things and started looking around and uh, we started it was born. So we originally started talking, uh, Dick Polis, the president of the WAS at the time, uh, talked to his neighbor Harold May about acquiring a 40 acre farm. Uh, that didn't work out, but but his but Harold May was a member of the Rotary Club in Warren, and they had a camp in Ray Township near Romeo, Camp Rotary. They were in need of, a tr of an attraction at their camp to bring more youth groups to camp out there, and we came in. So uh, we started. Con so the original plans for Stargate were to have a nice little roll-off roof building that was convenient to work with, but the Rotary Club had slightly other plans. They wanted to have a dome, they wanted to have that symbol of astronomy that everyone recognizes. So we broke ground in autumn 1969, so this is the anniversary of that, and uh, immediately got to work. So Jerry Allier uh, started refiguring the, the mirrors of 12 and a half inch classical Newtonian, in, and to turn it into a classical Cassegrain. So it went from being an F4 telescope to an F17 telescope. Um, while he was working on that, uh, the WAS was building the, with the help of the Rotary Club, we were building the center block base, and uh, we went to Dick Polis's garage to build the dome. So we got the, uh, the angle iron for the dome, from Hoffley Manufacturing in Warren, which just went on a business a couple of years ago, we found out. And uh, they, we built the dome and got it in place. And finally, on August 26th of 1970, we, uh, we got, we were ready to open, open up Stargate to everybody. So we had delegates from the Rotary Club come out Tour the facility. We were hoping we were hoping hoping to have an open house and show people the sky through the Stargate telescope, the newly reborn Stargate telescope. And as you might expect, it was cloudy, so that didn't happen. But first light came not long thereafter. What was going on in the world in 1970? Way too much for me to talk about here because <laughs> I've got 70 slides left. Oh. Uh, <laughs> But uh, you may wonder, where did the name Stargate come from? Well, we actually had a poll to name the observatory. Uh, one of the submissions for the poll was Chris Edsel's Stargate. And uh, it's noted in Memories of the Time that a lot of the ballots had the same handwriting. So make what you will of that. But I think it's a pretty cool name. And it, there's only three Stargate observatories in the world. One of them is in the foothills of the Himalaya Mountains in India. One of them is was in Wasilla, Alaska, home of Sarah Palin, and the third one is in Ray Township. So it's kind of interesting, kind of interesting company to be in. So I'm, I love Ernie, but uh, the name way predates the movie. Of the it, same day. Yes, a lot, we didn't get the name from the movie. That's for sure. So Stargate is born. It opens and it starts growing up. We have the reality. We get to see our dreams realized. We get to have lots of star parties out there. This is uh, Chris Dennington, I think. I'm given to believe Joe Toko took this uh, photo in his youth, but I'm not sure if that's true. Here's our scope on the pier. And uh, here we have a slight bit of copyright violation. Um, but, uh, but we had... We were able to have dark sky star parties, we were able to do Messier contests, we were able to do everything that we ever wanted to do with an observatory. And then we got all the other stuff that comes free with owning an observatory, like neighbors uh, maybe adjusting things when you don't want. You have the devil here standing, I don't know who that is, but, uh, and then the infamous light pole that we finally had the key to after and we finally got the key to after about 25 years. So, so this is uh, one of Frank McCullough's many sketches of life at Stargate. So, the light pollution came almost as soon as the observatory was there. Uh, what else happened? We had to do a lot of maintenance. 
So this is a artist's rendition of spring cleanup. The dome is lying over here against the tree. The light is shining there, and the poor Stargate telescope is out in the wind. Uh, and of course, we had weather. Conjunction of Mars, we were there. So um, you've got the, the poor guy with the uh, umbrella there. And uh, I want to read you a bit of news from Camp Rotary circa 1972. Camp Rotary, Michigan, an unconfirmed UFO sighting was reported here today as record gale force winds, ah, <laughs> as record gale force winds swept through the central section of the state. Mr. B.S. Goldwater was tying down his small single engine plane where he, when he claims to have seen a silver dome shaped thingy traveling in a wobbly arc over the surrounding meadows. <laughs> that being our dome. Goldwater also said that he saw two strange creatures near the UFO. Them cr critters, there was two of them, and they were chasing after that flying saucer with telescopes in their hands. So it goes on. It's in the wasp. You should go check it out. So it's quite amusing. And then sometimes all of the above. You have... You have TNT around the base of the Stargate. You think things are getting a little too much for them at that time. And you have uh, Stargate filled with water and fish swimming around inside. And an octopus there in the corner. And a shark in the background. So we finally fixed that leak. Uh, so we actually had our share of successes too. We got the news media out in 1980 to... Uh, to cover our doings out there, and we've had many visitors through that period up to the present date. So, in so this is the 80s. I don't have too many pictures from the early days, but uh, yeah, not to mention the uh, all the battery packs. Uh, so, in the 1990s, in 1995, I think we started building the big dog, uh, and the the amateur telescope making group was in full swing. Everybody was making telescopes. Everyone was taking them out. So, so here's our former president, Blaine McCullough, with uh, his his scope, one of the finest scopes to come out of the amateur telescope making group. We actually own that telescope. It's in the dump shed and needs some love. Uh, here's a picnic back in the day. I believe this is Mike O'Dowd here. Uh, we have Joe Van Cooker over here, yeah. and Dennis Schmalzel looking through the uh, classical Casa Green there. Uh, in 1990, from 1992 to 1994, as part of the early work of the amateur telescope making group, it was refurbished and turned into a hybrid telescope. You might notice that Dennis is not using the classical Casa Green, right? He's looking through an eyepiece coming out of the side of the telescope. What we did was we uh, redesigned it so that we could put the nose piece back on and turn it back into a Newtonian telescope, or we could use it in a classical Cassic Ring configuration. So it's a pretty neat telescope. We still do own it, but we'll talk a little bit about its current state later. Here's Blaine at the Stargate telescope in its new Newtonian configuration, doing some solar observing. Uh, don't recall who this is. Does anyone know? Is that Larry Kellenhaus? I don't think so. There's a JPL. There's. It, is it Roger Tanner? Maybe I don't know. But uh, I don't know. So so, either it's a visitor or one of us. But it's nice to see him in the observatory. So in 2002, so we have this big dog. We've built this beautiful. 22-inch, 10-foot-tall telescope, but it couldn't stay in the observatory because we didn't have any place to put it. So in May of 2002, we built a dedicated shed for the Big Dog. So I've got the whole set of slides here. So from, from the poured concrete base to the floor, to one wall, another wall, a third wall, putting in the floor on top of the cement. No fourth wall. The, the fourth wall the fourth wall went on some well the we put on the uh, big doors here the double door entryway uh, put on the the roof and the roof joists uh, started putting on the the deck and the underlayment and the shingles and finally we had a building 
Has anyone ever tried to break in? I'm not at liberty to answer that question. Okay. So we have uh, Bob Watt, uh, Phil Beers, boy these are darker on the screen, uh, Blaine McCullough, Bob, Bill, do you recall everybody who was out there? I think oh, Dennis, this, Dennis this, picture, this picture doesn't do it justice. We had, and Mark, you can verify this. I, because I'm down on the bottom one now with the red hat right there. there I took the picture. <laughs> I took all the pictures. So. When we were at Selwyn, there had to have been probably eight or nine Steve of us Green, out there. Bob Watt, Dennis yeah. Schmalzel, we had uh, a bill was on the, the hammer gun. Blaine. 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 Yeah. Um, and then we had another day that... Ken Burton was out there, I believe. I had several times out there. But this was done on what two days? Yep, Whoa, May wow. twenty, days. May twenty second and twenty third, two thousand two. Nice work, guys. So, and here's here's Stargate with the newly, almost completed. You can see the siding wasn't quite on, but but that that was Stargate. So this is a photo from Steve Agus. This is the uh, Stargate telescope uh, at I think at night uh, with with the flashbulb with the old mount. So. And getting more towards the present day, Lee Hartwell and Bob Berta doing outreach out at Stargate. One of the primary reasons for a club to exist, one of the best places for us to do it with all the scouts and all the visitors and all the families and all the educational groups that come through Camp Rotary. And I think, think that's Dale Parton there as well. And this is Mike O'Dowd using his drone. This is, I think, the first ever drone photo taken of Stargate. So here's the two buildings down there. So, Stargate was a great site, but things are getting a little bit hard to use inside the dome. We had a lot of leaks, we had a lot of water infiltration everywhere, we had the old mount breaking down, the, uh, the tube was starting to sag a little bit, and uh, generally the observatory, the, the building itself was not getting very much use for observing. We used the big dab constantly, we brought out telescopes constantly, but we didn't do very much observing from the dome. So we decided either we were going to turn the observatory into a really fancy looking warming room, or we were going to make it an observatory again. So in July of 2009, after I think Gary Ross made motions towards turning it into a warming room, action kicked in to revive Stargate. We took the uh, dome off, stripped it down to bare metal. Whoops. You have uh, Brian Timmy up here on the roof, Steve Woody over here, Alan Kaplan and Larry Phipps over here. These are all Cheryl Kaplan's photos. Bob Bird and the uh, full mask, Larry and Bob Watt. Riyadh in here putting in a new floor. Cheryl, is this you? Yeah, that's me. And Bob Bird painting inside the dome. This guy up here with long hair, and this other guy, Marty Coons, with long hair, uh, working on the corner there. Uh, it was, most of the work was completed in one weekend. It was a pretty grueling weekend, but uh, it had pretty good results. There was still work to be done when most of us went back to our jobs. There's Diane taking an early day off work to head out and paint the dome before we had it craned lifted back on top of the observatory. And you can see this is after we put the telescope back in and uh, we're starting to get close. Here's Andy Kula, the donor of the Kula Mount, and Dick Ingla. So we completed the project. We had an observatory that was closer to watertight uh, with fresh wood, fresh shingles, and much more usable than it had been. And we were ready to celebrate. So this is our picnic. As you can see, there's a lot of rain coming down at our picnic. <laughs> Ryan and Denver champions. Uh, but it did clear out midday, and we got the big job out and actually did a little bit of observing that night to celebrate. I think you have Phil Martin taking a picture over here. Here's our, here's our 2009 group picnic. So the goal was to have the observatory usable again by the picnic, and I think we hit that goal. Brian Klaus is up here at the picnic, and we had a lot of mini discussion groups going on. One prominent feature of picnics in, the, in recent days have, has been uh, Jim Shedlowski's guitar playing. Uh, so 
I don't think we've gone a picnic in the last 10 years or even longer without uh, some music from Jim. And here's a shot of the Stargate telescope standing proud at that first uh, picnic after the work party. You can see one of the coolest features of the big of the uh, Stargate telescope here visually, and we'll revisit <coughs> that in a bit. So, and uh, a lot of a lot of fun. So we had a problem with the dog shed. It was well built. It was keeping the water out, but we had a lot of stuff, and the amount of stuff that we owned was growing. And at the time, we didn't have any shelving inside. So uh, on, in July 2010, the next year after the big revival, uh, Bob Berta led a team, including Bob Watt, Syra Ejigopalan, Ken Burton, and me, to uh, put shelving in. And it was a great project, and we never had to worry about space in the dog shed again. <laughs> oh, well, we'll talk about it. So this kicked off a new era of being proud of our observatory. Here's a night vision. Uh, so one thing that I couldn't find the photos for, Mark Kedz here assures me that the photo is in the WASP back in 2011, but Mark and I, Mark spent nine and a half hours in, I think, 103 degree weather, uh, sealing off the last leaks in the dome on the flat parts around the, the dome hole. And uh, I was there for eight and a half hours of that. So it was uh, a very long day that culminated in a trip to the, uh, the Red Apple Inn uh, that was very well deserved. But uh, I think we haven't had a leak, as far as I know, in the observatory Shh. since. I know, I know. Where's some wood? Knock on press board. Uh, so Joe Toko, definitely one of the heroes of the modern era of, of Stargate. Uh, this is the final work on putting in the carpet. We, uh, we replaced the floor here, and uh, after a little while with a cement floor again, we uh, decided that we were tired of having our feet and lower legs freeze solid during the wintertime. <coughs> put in a new floor. Uh, Gary Ross did a lot of the work on that, and Joe and a bunch of other people. Um, and uh, we have some very beautiful artistic photos from that era, so I'm just going to go through some of them. This, unfortunately, is too real a photo, but uh, <laughs> it is a very beautiful photo. Here is a beautiful digital painting by Brian Teeny of Stargate in Wintertime. Uh, I don't know who went up on the roof with all that snow and opened the dome, but God bless him. Um, it, was, it was Jeff. Uh, and here's sunrise at Stargate. Or is it sunset? I guess it's sunset. But it's beautiful either way. So, everything's good, except we are having lots and lots of problems with the the, the tube of the, of the Stargate telescope is pretty warped. Uh, the images are not what we want them to be. In the F-17, classical Cassegrain mode, there's a very small field of view. Uh, we can't do a lot of wide-angle stuff. And in those days, we really weren't using it in the Newtonian configuration. So, uh, A plan emerged to get a new telescope and put it in there. And uh, oh, so... We were donated, uh, um, after Larry Kalinowski's death, Mark Kalinowski, his son, donated a large sum of money towards getting a new telescope to install in the dome. And, uh, and that sort of kicked off the process. So this is the last light party for the Stargate telescope uh, before we replace it. And so here you can see the beautiful these are constellations on the back of the Stargate telescope. And as far as I know, those have been there since the 60s. So Here's Riyadh uh, with, with taking some of his last looks through the Stargate telescope. And uh, people have told me, 
people who were there who told me that this was an out, this is out of order. We brought in the new telescope before we took the old one out, but gosh darn it, it makes a better story this way. So here is the decommissioning of the Stargate telescope. We took it down. It is currently taking up about a third of the uh, dab shed between the, the mount and the telescope. But it will live again someday. Here is the new Kalinowski Kula OTA coming in. Here is Joe unpacking the beautiful new objective with Riyadh and the unwrapping the bubble wrap from the OTA. Joe Toko built a custom cradle to hold, to adapt between the old, uh, the old rings for the Stargate telescope and the much smaller aperture Kalinowski telescope. And so he built this wooden cradle, he measured everything, and kept working on it until it was a perfect fit. And that did its job for quite some time. So here is the new OTA going in. There's the wall of fame back there that Ken Strom built back in 1986. Uh, here's the telescope right after it was installed for the very first time. And uh, so that got us a working version of the of the Kalinowski telescope, but we were still having many, many problems with this beautiful but very, very hard-worn uh, 1960s mount. So we had Andy Kula, a longtime member of the club and a neighbor of the observatory, donate his beautiful and very high-class uh, astrophysics mount and from September 3rd through, so this was, we got the new telescope in May of 2014. Uh, from September 3rd through 5th, we decommissioned the old mount, brought in the new astrophysics mount that Andy donated. And here's Andy and Riyadh installing it on the pier. And here they are getting the, uh, with the telescope, uh, the rings and the mounting plate installed. You see there's our Larry Kalinowski plaque up there. Here's Andy uh, making some last adjustments. And finally on the night of September 10th, 2014, uh, we actually got the Kalinowski Kula telescope fully assembled for the first time. You may notice that there's no uh, dew shield up here. That didn't come for several other months. And D and G have done a wonderful job on our telescope. We love it very much. We couldn't get them to send us a bill for about eight months or ten months after we received the telescope. So it was free for the, almost the first year. So, you know, that's a pretty good deal. And this is Mark Kalinowski with his uh, with the telescope that is named after his dad with his dad's plaque on the wall behind him. <coughs> and then finally, you see this beautiful Explore Scientific uh, Finder Scope. Here's Ken Burton, who donated the finder scope, getting his first look on its installation <laughs> on December 12, 2014. And with the installation of the finder scope with the illuminated reticle and everything, we finally had, and I think the dew shield came in in December as well, we finally had a fully operational observatory, and we finally were totally in business at Stargate with the Kalinowski <coughs> Observatory. Ken, was that a good view or a bad view if you're looking through the... Uh, that's joy right there. That's joy. That's what, okay. that's it was, was utter joy. Okay. <laughs> and so this is another drone photo thanks to Mike O'Dowd. So, that more or less brings us to the present era. It's 2015 now, or 2019 now. It's been five years that we've been in full operation with this setup. And uh, we're still getting great views. Uh, many things have happened since then. We've, we got a beautiful final viewer. We got a power filter slide that makes it really easy to slide in a focal reducer that widens the angle that we look at, or a Barlow that magnifies, or different nebula filters and uh, sky glow filters. Uh, we have, we've gotten some pretty nice eyepieces out there. We have some camera equipment out there that we don't, to my knowledge, ever use. It would be really great. This is a great astrophotography platform. We need photos for the calendar. 
this is available to our members to use, and uh, we would really like to have you start using it for astrophotography. Oh. So, uh, and I personally would also like to, I don't have the budget, I'm not willing to have the budget to uh, get into astrophotography seriously myself, and this is, take, this would take me a lot farther than anything that I could buy. So, now I'd like to talk about the future of Stargate. So, right now, the biggest impediment to getting value out of the observatory that we have is the fact that in order to open this dome, you have to lean a ladder up against, wow, you need to lean a ladder up against this uh, ladder holder, <coughs> climb up the ladder, un unlock the telescope, the, uh, the dome latch, pull open the shutter, pull back the shutter, and then climb back down. And then at the end of the night, you need to go back up there, and then <clears throat> in the wintertime, that's a pretty scary prospect. For a lot of people in the club, we're not quite as spry as we used to be. I, I am definitely slower up the ladder than I used to be myself. And uh, in terms of having an observatory that everybody can use, and that people can go out and maybe use on their own, it's really not doing what we would like to get out. So we have a number of options for making the dome more usable. Uh, basically, we need an automated solution. We need a way to be able to press a button and push out, basically roll back this, the upper part of the door and then push out the lower part of the door. It's a pretty simple set of parts that you need to do that. Uh, but you need to get power to them. You need to make sure that the way you get power to them is not going to collide with anything. You need to make sure that the dome rolls more smoothly than it currently does. And you need to make sure that whatever you build, people are going to be able to maintain in the future. So, probably DIY is our best bet for automating this dome and making it usable 365 days a year and usable without a safety spotter to make sure you don't fall off the roof. Um, but there are some other options and we started pricing them out because, you know, we've got over $20,000 <laughs> in the bank account. Surely we can afford to buy some stuff. So this is the cheapest option. This is a 10-foot dome from Technical Innovations. They charge $13,000 for this dome. Installation is on you. Jose, yes? Yeah, you got electric power there? I'm sorry? Yeah. Electric power. Yeah. We do have electric power. That's the, that is one big thing we have going for us. Oh. We, don't, we don't have uh, internet, we don't have <laughs> Wi-Fi, but we do have power. And uh, the park actually pays for it for us, so we're very grateful to the Metro Parks for that. So, so yeah, the dome is fully powered. Like you saw at the Lincoln High School, it was purely a hand crate system, yeah. but uh, at Stargate, everything is powered. But if you were going to automate the dome, you would probably use an auto battery attached to the dome, because then you don't have to run. The dome is turning, right? You don't want to have cords going from the dome to the building. Right. So you need to have a detached power system. Did I have, uh, Jerry? How many amp service do you have, do you know? I think, I, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Does anyone know what what power load we can carry out there? 60 by 100. Okay. okay. So 60 amps is a lot, it's a lot. So, all right, Ash Dome, which is what Cranbrook has, for our size dome, they charge $17,000. They can install it. I get the sense that installation is about seven to eight thousand dollars. So right there, we've blown past our, you know, with this dome, we have to install it ourselves. So have we really made it any easier than the pure DIY solution? I don't know. This dome again is fifty years old. It's still in pretty good physical shape, but there is definitely rust that we can't quite get rid of. Um, what about an open dome? <clears throat> so we'll we'll get there. Uh, observatory solutions, another sort of standard dome, 18000 They actually do quote installation fees at $7,000, uh, not including airfare and lodging while they're 
technicians are in town. And then the prices start shooting up. Observe a dome. Wouldn't you love to have something like this on top of Stargate? But uh, you're talking $45,000 before you even get to the installation. And then there's the Astro Haven Dome. Fiberglass, beautiful clamshell. We can point the telescope anywhere we want to. We can get stuff all the way down to the horizon. But the top level is $172,000. So if anyone knows any billionaires, <laughs> if they could, you know, sneeze $200,000 our way, it would help a lot. And, you know, we actually, we have a member who will not be named until I get confirmed that he's okay with being named, but we have a member who is going to work professionally for Blue Origin out in Seattle. So hopefully he'll be able to talk to Jeff more than I have about getting us that $200,000. So, well, they take a full student. So, <laughs> so this is, you know, a beautiful thing, probably outside what we're reasonably going to do. Um, they do, even though it looks like something that you're meant to sort of access from inside a circular building, they do actually let, uh, they do actually adapt this to conventional roofs as well. So it is an option, but it's definitely on the extreme end of what we could possibly get from grants or whatever other funding mechanisms. If you have something like this here, could you possibly get a larger telescope? Uh, no. Basically, our telescope is about the biggest telescope. It's At least it's the longest, like for a refractor telescope, it's the biggest, longest telescope that you can get in the dome. If you went to a shorter refractor at the same size, you're going to start getting lots of color in the image, which is going to make it harder to image with less pleasant for people who don't take well to chromatic aberration and uh, yeah so um, I you know we could always go back to a Schmidt Cassegrain or some other design but I'm I for one am not ready to uh, get rid of our current telescope yet uh, so so these are sort of the options David Bransky has been working for his entire term as second vice president on quoting these things out and talking to the companies. And there just isn't an easy, there's, there's not an easy option that fits in the budget that we already have. Yeah, we could probably do ash dome. We could probably scrape up another $5,000 or $10,000 if we needed to and install it. Uh, but it's still, it would completely blow out our bank. It would make us a lot less resilient to anything that may come our way. And uh, I think we're reluctant to do that before we exhaust the options. So, Cheryl. Um, it seems to me that a while ago we were talking about this, and there was a question about who owns what at the, yeah. at the observatory. So that's a great point. So basically, uh, so Stargate Observatory is part of Wolcott Mill Metro Park. It's part of Camp Rotary, which is part of Wolcott Mill. Wolcott Mill owns the cinder block part of the building. Basically, we own the roof, we own the dome. We own all the stuff inside the buildings. But I think that Wolcott Mill actually owns the buildings themselves, which is kind of better for us from a number of perspectives. But what do they have a say in what you can put on the building? They absolutely have a say in basically any structural or visible changes we make to the building. Technically so, speaking, our entire renovation period was not listed. Well, that's, I mean, it definitely things were bad enough that they were very excited to have us back in business. Uh, Wait, there real been, quick, no one here works for the Metro Parks. <laughs> okay, this is on the But, uh, <laughs> but uh, basically, um, basically, uh, Wolcott Mill has had a lot of change in its leadership, so it's, we haven't really worked with the same people for very long. So every few years, we kind of have to renegotiate what we can do out at the observatory, even in terms of putting stuff up on the walls and putting stuff up on, you know, putting up signage. So it's, uh, we have a really good relationship with them, but we definitely have to periodically restate that relationship with them. That's the building so, inspectors, right? Uh, so they have to approve any actual building. Uh, so this is this is at the park leadership level. There may be other levels as well. So what's the weight of the dome to get in? Michigan has very strong winds. 
Mm -hmm. And you would, would, you would want to have something like that and then have a wind come and knock yep. it good over. Yeah, so most of these are steel. Uh, I think <coughs> the edge dome is a little bit. Um, our, our dome is steel, obviously. It's a, besides that spoof news article, it's not actually going <coughs> to blow away in, in a storm. But uh, unless we get a much bigger storm than we normally do around here. Even this, uh, I believe this is fiberglass, but honestly, I, I just don't think there's that much for wind to grab onto. Like, maybe if we get a derecho over Stargate, we're in trouble, but honestly, if you get a derecho with any kind, even with a roll-off roof, you're in trouble. So, and, of course, the dome is something we own. It's covered under our insurance. <coughs> but, uh, if, yes, yes, Alan. So, let me get this straight. The buildings that were built by WAS members do not belong to WAS. That is true. The Dobbs shed does. The Dobbs shed does. Well, does belong to WAS. They, we can't prove that it doesn't belong to us. Yes. <laughs> it's not like we can sell it, so... Yeah. You don't it's, really own it. it basically, basically, should we ever get evicted from Old Cobb Mill, we have a world of problems um, <laughs> no matter what happens. So uh, let's... Try not to do that. <laughs> do we have any financial records from 2002? We bought all the materials to build the Dobbs shed. You know, we poured the cement. We did all that stuff. Yeah. I, think, I mean, I think we have photographic evidence, and nobody has there's evidence no, otherwise. And, but we aren't going to move the yeah. Dobbs shed anywhere. There's like, just no so. paper trail on the park side indicating who owns what. So by default, they said, okay, it's yours. The Dobbs shed only. Sorry. Over again. But we don't, no, so, uh, so that's sort of where we are on the dome. That's our most pressing issue in terms of what we can actually do with the Stargate property and why we don't use it, at least from a volunteer perspective, why we don't use it quite as often as we might. Um, there are other reasons. Definitely the core of people coming out to Stargate on any given open house night is pretty variable. I think in general it is noticeably down probably 30 to 50 percent from where it was back in 2015 when Stargate had been refurbished and reopened again. Uh, we don't have, we still have a lot of people coming out, but in terms of volunteers bringing out <coughs> telescopes, there's a noticeable decline from where we were a few years ago. So, uh, so to that end, the next thing I want to talk about, unless anybody has some leads, like knows some people who do automation, automation systems who might be able to consult with us for this in something that fits in our price range, uh, or if you are a person who has some ideas about what we can do with automation here, uh, we would really love to hear it. If you know anybody, if any of your family we members or friends... Out, we would reached out to the magazine Sky and Telescope and Astronomy Magazine. Both of their, their presidents are pretty good friends of ours as, a, as an overall thing. Wondering maybe they can give us some leads. And it would be interesting to ask them. Uh, yeah, it might be, I mean, really maybe what we should try doing is going on to some of the big discussion forums like Cloudy Nights and seeing if we can get some recommendations there. Because to my way of thinking, it, it seems pretty obvious that it's going to be easier to retrofit our existing dome with some system that makes it safer to use in the wintertime. That, that locks the dome without having a lock on the outside, that prevents us from having to climb on the ladder, that allows us to have a second vice president who doesn't have to be a roofer. Like, uh, you know, it's, it, it would really make it easier to be second vice president if you don't have to be the guy or woman climbing on top of the dome at the end of the night at 2 in the morning when you want to go home. So... Uh, I've used, I've been lucky enough to visit a lot of observatories that are fully automated and it is so much less stress. At the end of the observing session, you hit the button and it closes up and you look, shut everything down and you leave. Like, you don't have to climb on anything. It's a good feeling. So, so that's where it is. Jose? Uh, what about the garage open uh, uh, guys, if you know somebody? Well, most garages aren't spherical though, so it's it's just a much harder problem to solve. It's not hugely it's not difficult to solve. Like there are known problems, but garage door a lot of garage door companies make a lot of money 
just doing regular garage doors, yeah. and they're not really looking for challenges <clears throat> on of this kind. But if you know anybody who you think might be willing to spend some extra time on a project like this, yeah, no, I mean, but the thing is, they make enough money doing easy yeah. stuff that they don't have to do hard stuff to make money, yes. and this is hard stuff. So yeah. I, I would love to know any anybody uh, who might be willing to do some slightly, you know below market value work on a problem like this. Right, right. So, ongoing projects besides making the dome useful. I'm sorry, Alan, go ahead. Has anybody considered, instead of having a round, like you were initially talking about, a slide over yep. like dome? It's something that, you know, a roll-off roof is much easier to work with. Yes. Our building is not built to be a roll-off roof building. We right. have a 12 by, or what, 15 by 15 building. Yeah, and the Metro and Park isn't too keen on uh, us putting in new foundations. So like the holes that you would need for the roll off and stuff, mm -hmm. they're, we mm -hmm. might be able to do it, but they're, they weren't keen on it when we wanted to put benches in. Yeah, yep. right, they didn't want any permanent, uh, permanent holes put in the ground that people could run into, or I don't, I'm not sure. If we have tour groups, does the park say that they want some of that profit? Well, we don't charge, I mean, we never charge for people to come to observatory events. We open up the observatory for free. Of course, we always accept donations, but uh, we don't charge money for any of the activities that we do out of the observatory. We have an MOU with the parks where it stipulates which events that we do for, for their benefit in conjunction with them solve. for a year. One day we're going to But, uh, so, beyond... Beyond those, but definitely the park does like having a dome. Like, when you see a dome, you think astronomy, and roll-off roofs just don't impress people the same way. They're a lot more practical. If we were going to build a roll-off roof building, which we're going to talk about in a minute, we would have a much narrower building, and the roof, we would need to design it so the roof is much narrower and easier to roll off. You don't want to roll off a 14-foot square roof that is, you know, that has four uh, gables. What are the what are the the corners called? Uh, but a, a roof that complex, you really don't want to turn into a roll-off roof. So, but we'll talk about potentially having a roll-off roof observatory starting shortly. But the <coughs> ongoing projects that are really actively happening right now are. The Dob Shed, you might have gotten my joke earlier, you might not have, but the Dob Shed is so packed with stuff. Historical stuff, telescopes made by some of our early founders, telescopes worked on by Jerry Allier, I think one that was worked on by Clarence Trott. Um, they are not, they are cardboard tube or Formica tube telescopes. Nobody really wants to use them, and so keeping them in the Dob Shed and making telescopes that we could use inaccessible is getting to be a problem. So we're going to need to go through with, we, we have about uh, six Rubbermaid large containers of telescope making equipment, a telescope grinding machine, grit of various <coughs> sizes, uh, telescope mirror blanks, all of that is taking up space on the shelves out there. I would love to get into telescope making myself, but as many of us are, I'm very pressed for time, and it's not something that I'm probably going to start leading. So something, if somebody wants to start a telescope making group, uh, we would love to give you lots of rubber maids of great tools and materials uh, and help you get that started. Um, beyond that, I think we need to look at the Dob Shed as less of a place to put all of our stuff and more of a place that we keep telescopes that we want to use for outreach. The Blaine McCullough Telescope is a beautiful 13 and a half inch telescope that we haven't used in about five years, I think. It needs some, it needs to be put on, either we need to get like a, a dolly that makes it easier to move around before we start using it. Uh, we need to re-silver the mirror. We need to do some work on it. But there's not that much work that needs to be done to make it one of the best telescopes available to the public in the Metro Detroit area. Um, 
we have uh, a number of cathode grain telescopes that literally haven't seen the light of night in five or six years because they are in the back corner of the dob shed and we can't get to them to get them out. We have a telescope loaner program where you can actually check out a telescope. I don't think we've checked out a telescope in at least four years at this point. And we had been checking them out pretty regularly at least every three or four months. And uh, that's kind of slowed down. Yes, Jose? Uh, what about the Lincoln School? They got one over there. How well, do they open it up? Well, they have, yeah, they have an observatory. They don't have a telescope, but putting in that pier yeah. and getting that mount. And then, like, even if we gave them a telescope, they're talking about thousands of dollars worth of work to get that in there, and they're worried about having an observatory. They don't have somebody to run the observatory. Maybe it's something that we could help with, but it's not something that we're in a great position to lead. If they were interested, I think we would be really interested in helping them. What about just taking it from them? <laughs> well, so but their dome, their dome isn't in any better shape. Their dome is older than ours. Their dome dates back to 1953. How does it open? It's uh, same same as ours. But but you take a staircase up to that level, and then there's a door in the wall, and you go out, and you don't have to climb on top of the building. You're already on top of the building. So, I'm sorry. What what time is it? Uh, so, so basically, these are our main questions. Like, what equipment do we need to have to actually help serve the public? What equipment do we need to have out there that members are actually interested in checking out and taking home? How do we get the telescope loaner program active again? How do we convince people to, to not buy a telescope until they come out and check out a couple types of telescopes from our observatory first? So those are difficult questions. There's some new projects that we keep talking about. We keep talking about putting in a third building, a third building that would be half a, basically half a warming room that we could have a little library in and move our library in there permanently, and half a roll-off roof that we can mount the Stargate telescope back in, put it, you know, we'll, we need to do work on the tube, and we need to maybe... We definitely need to resilver it and recode it, but uh, it would be wonderful to have a place where we can warm up in the winter time. We can also roll off the roof and use a great classical Cassegrain or a classical Newtonian telescope, and a telescope that has really deep roots in the origins of our club. So that's this is listed as three projects, but they all kind of go together. Like that's sort of my dream. Um, it wouldn't have to be a hugely expensive building. Obviously, we need to get the Metro Parks to sign off on it. We think we have a pretty good chance at doing that. But if you're interested in being part of this project, uh, please let us know. There's a number of people who are already interested. And I think we need somebody to sort of lead the charge on getting it active. The, one of the hurdles with the Metro Parks is they really want professional grade prints before they approve it. Mm -hmm. So a sketch is not going to cut it because we've, we've been there with them. So if, if anybody has any talent with straight up drafting, architecture blueprints, <coughs> that's what they want to see. A really in-depth schematic. It's a tall order for our group, but, but hopefully. So, so just to, in conclusion in our last couple minutes, why do we have Stargate? Why do we care about Stargate? Is it just a great place to do outreach where we have scouting groups, Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts, and all sorts of different educational groups coming in frequently, where we sort of have a captive audience where we are the entertainment of the park. That's a great reason to have it. Is it recruitment? People come out to Stargate for the first time. I think a number of people in the room here got recruited into the club after coming out to an event at Stargate. Is it for us to do personal observing? I think that is one of the areas where it's really fallen into less use in recent years, where I go out there to do observing because I live in Dearborn where the skies are truly awful, but I know a number of people in the club live or have property in places where the sky is much darker, and there's a lot less reason for them to go out to Stargate to do quasi-dark sky observing. Can we use Stargate as an imaging center? Can we use it to do group astrophotography projects where we can start to learn how to use SLRs with a T adapter with a beautiful 8-inch telescope on a good solid tracking mount. Like, 
Is it a place where we can get, can we get people to stop buying the first telescope they fall in love with on a website and come out and try a couple different types of telescopes before they actually make that more or less permanent commitment? So many people buy a telescope, it isn't right for their needs, and then they give up on astronomy. And we really, it's in our best interest as a interest group, as a club, as a group that needs people to stay interested in astronomy, to stop that process from happening and get people to learn the night sky, learn what they can see before they buy some extremely expensive and hard to set up telescope that is too much work for them to reasonably take, throw in their car, drive to a dark sky site and observe with. Is it, one of the, my favorite things that I've ever done at Stargate, and I've only done it twice, is Messier contests, where you get a whole bunch of people on the field and try to get them to find as many Messier objects as possible. If you're looking for Messier 79, the globular cluster in Lepus underneath Orion's shins, uh, in the early winter time, that is in the Detroit Sky Glow. I've looked at that with large telescopes and not seen anything at all. So, definitely, some you're not going to do a full Messier marathon at Stargate in a night because the southern skylight pollution is just too intense. But there's a lot that we could be doing that would improve our ability to observe, that would give us something fun to do as a club that isn't just listening to presentations in a room, and isn't just doing outreach. Because outreach is great, but we also have to keep our interest in astronomy alive and keep exploring things that we can get excited about that we can share with other people. And then finally, I think the main reason that we love Stargate is it's a rallying point. It's a place that we can go for the big astronomical events. It's a place we can go for Astronomy Day, for our picnic, for uh, the 50th anniversary celebration next August 26th, be there. Uh, you know, it's a place that we have of our own. That's something that almost, I don't know of any other uh, astronomy clubs in southeastern Michigan that can say that. Um, everyone else is in a much more temporary position than we are. And that's a great thing to have. That is worth more than almost anything. Sometimes it's even more, worth more than dark skies. So, did you? So how can the loss keep Stargate alive, and how can it keep us alive? How can it keep our members engaged and interested in astronomy and willing to volunteer for the club, both at the observatory and at meetings like this and in all the days in between? Yes, Ken? Only I, I noticed that you guys did something with the executive board meeting about solar telescope. Yes, we did buy, we bought a... Uh, a Daystar solar telescope. We're mount that on this and telescope. we may mount it permanently on the, the, the scope or we may get a mount for it. We haven't decided exactly the mounting situation yet. That would really be cool because that makes it daytime too. Right? right. The only problem is you have to make sure that you keep the big telescope capped or else of bad course. things will happen. Yes, Dale? The other problem with mounting the, the solar scope on the side of the refractor is that means you have to open the dome. Yep, that's and true. I, and, and it's a real lightweight telescope. So if we get any kind of mount... Yeah, uh, yeah you can pick it up and carry it around really easily. Oh, with one hand. The only thing is it does require power, and so if you're already on, if it's already mounted to the scope, you just plug it in and run the wire when you're using it, and unplug it and put the power yeah. supply away when you're not. So there, that's one nice thing about having it mounted on the scope. But, we haven't made a permanent decision. I don't know what happened. This is our logo. Uh, but uh, but imagine, here, let me edit Let me edit that out really quick. So that's not the defining uh, image of this presentation. So, so you, may, you may notice that this is... Uh, what, what about it's still the trees have grown. They have. That, that is, so this is the exact same photo that you already saw uh, at the start of the presentation. Um, it is, I guess I could maybe that. What about a sliding door on a track that, that opens it? So look how tiny those trees are back then wow. compared to the present day. It's 9.30. So anyhow. Uh, 
that's pretty much what I had to uh, say tonight. I hope this gives you a lot to think about and uh, maybe some ideas about how you can volunteer in the club. Maybe you can think of some people who do complex automation projects with very little financial reward. Um, so it's uh, it's definitely something that means a lot to your club. Yes, Mark. So thinking out loud, uh, I don't think we necessarily need like a robotic, you know, push a button and everything. Just some pulleys, you know. If we can bring the hasp inside, so you put the ladder up inside, lock it from inside. You're not going on a frozen roof. It definitely. The only problem with that is that if you do have, like if you have the lock inside, I guess, yeah, I guess you could probably figure out something yeah. like that. Maybe that's our best bet, yeah. you know. Um, but you do, we would need to get a taller ladder inside the dome than we currently have right. to be able to reach up because you need to have the, the moving door, the, yeah. the sliding shutter, uh, that needs to extend very far over the bottom shutter to make sure that we don't have any water infiltration around that that gap in between the two pieces of metal. What's the height? So, from, from, from what would you say, about 14, 14 feet? Probably, yeah. yeah. So probably, you know, maybe maybe the existing ladder, that might be something to experiment with the next time we're out there. Can we can we get on our normal safe ladder and get to the place yeah, where a, the two doors... Maybe yeah. a crank close kind of thing, you know, because it, it doesn't even have to be a padlock. Right, as long as, it's, as long as it's impossible to open from the outside. Yeah. Yeah. Alrighty, I think we're in time. Any last thoughts? Alrighty, thanks so much. Come to Stargate.